your whistleblower line. Alright, we're going to open up in prayer. And uh, Lord, we thank you, Lord God, for today. I thank you for each student here, those that are watching online. I thank you, Father God, for just working in our spirit, working in our heart, Lord, as we're studying different things, Lord, that, that some things we're passionate about, some things we're learning for the first time. Help us, Lord, just to grow in the knowledge and help us all constantly, Lord God, to, to look back and see what the Word says. What, what, what do you say about these, these times or what do you say about these situations? And help us to weigh out everything based on your word, Lord. And thank you for each student here for the input that they have, Lord. And I just give this time over to you, and I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week was crazy. Last week we had a really good conversation. And uh, it was pretty serious, okay? For the next two weeks we're going to be talking about something a little bit as serious. Uh, you're not there yet as far as what we're going to be talking about, but you need to be knowledgeable about this, okay? Uh, we're going to be talking about political parties and the election process. And it's like perfect timing for this class because we have a really serious election coming up, okay? Uh, so as we're going through this, to give an overview, just to kind of get like a better understanding of the election process or the political process that we have in our country, we're going to watch one of those crash course videos. This guy talks really fast, he throws the eagle around, um, I don't know if you get much from him, he's really funny, but he's also really serious. And he does explain everything, but you really have to kind of focus and pay attention to what he's saying. Okay? So try to follow along, and um, let's see what he says about election basics. Bear with me as I get this all together. This is on, isn't it? Is there a refresh button I have to hit or anything? Anybody know? Wait, I gotta make sure it's showing. Is there a little round thing up in the upper right hand corner, left hand corner? I see no round thing. Is my mouse moving around on the screen yet? No signal. How about now? That's it. Uh-huh. Okay. Craig, and this is Crash Course Government and Politics, and today I'm going to talk about an aspect of American politics that is probably most familiar to you, at least if you're an American and you sometimes watch TV, or look at the internet, or read the newspaper, or breathe air. I'm talking about elections, which get a lot of attention here in the U.S. and on Crash Course, possibly because they present a relatively straightforward narrative that is easy for the media to cover. But we're not going to focus on media coverage today. No, instead we're going to look at why we have elections in the first place and the institutions and procedures that structure the way elections work in America. We might even compare them to elections in other places, but I can't make any promises. <laughs> Before we get into the nitty gritty of how elections work in the U.S., it might be a good time to ask a question that rarely gets asked. Why do we have elections in the first place? The simple answer is complexity. America is too big and complex to hold public referendums on individual issues, although some states like California try to do it. So instead, we choose representatives. In other words, we vote for people, not policies. Elections are as good a system for holding these representatives accountable as any. Well, 
At least they're better than violence or public shaming. Political scientists and economists have a more complicated way of describing this in terms of adverse selection. Because why would we want a simple answer when we have political scientists and economists around? Well, they gotta do something. Adverse selection is a problem that can arise when we make a choice, but do not necessarily have all the information we need to make that choice. Kind of like when you buy a used car. Elections help to solve this problem because they are ideally competitive. The competition creates incentives for candidates to provide information about themselves and to make most of that information accurate since their opponent will call them out for any statements that are less than truthful. At least that's what we hope will happen. Elections also supposedly make candidates more accountable since they provide voters a chance to get rid of bad actors. Of course, this only works when elections are competitive, and as we'll see in a later episode, many elections in the U.S. really aren't. You might think that since elections are so important to our politics that they would be featured prominently in the Constitution. But yeah, no. The Constitution does set up a few basic guidelines that structure American elections, but most of the important rules that define the way elections are carried out come out of state laws, legal decisions, and local administrative practices. So what does the Constitution say about elections? Not a lot, as it turns out, except when it comes to choosing the president. The president just gets everything. President's so important. The Constitution does lay out the qualifications for running for federal office, which we already went over in our episodes on Congress and the President, and it describes the numbers of representatives and senators, but mostly the Constitution leaves elections up to the states. Article 1, Section 4 says, The times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. But the Congress may at any time, by law, make or alter such regulations, except as to the places of choosing senators. And the Constitution was later changed to allow for direct election of senators with the 17th Amendment. So that last clause doesn't matter so much anymore. The Constitution does say more about the way the president is chosen indirectly through the Electoral College, but the framers messed that up so badly that they had to amend the Constitution after the election of 1800. The Twelfth Amendment, which basically means that the president and vice president come from the same political party, although it doesn't actually say that, fixed the electoral process, so now it's flawless. But it's still indirect, and the qualifications for the electors who choose the president are still left up to the states. Some constitutional amendments also help to structure American elections. The 24th Amendment outlawed poll taxes, which made it easier for poor people to vote. And the 26th Amendment lowered the voting age from 21 to 18. In general, when Congress addresses voting issues, it's to try to expand the pool of voters. Although the Constitution doesn't specify when elections happen, it does give Congress the power to do so, and it requires that the day on which the electors choose the president has to be one single day. This is in Article 2. The Congress may determine the time of choosing the electors and the day on which they shall give their votes, which day shall be the same throughout the United States. Congressional laws also help structure elections by making them more fair. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 set up a number of systems to increase voter participation by minority groups, especially African Americans. And Congress also set up the Federal Election Commission, which has some say over elections. I'll tell you who should never be able to vote. Eagles. You're gerrymandered out of here. But generally, following the Constitution, most aspects of elections are under the control of the states. State laws define how candidates are nominated and get on the ballot, and they can influence the operation of political parties. State laws also determine registration requirements for voting and set up the location and hours of polling places, which vary a lot from state to state. Probably most important for federal elections, states decide the boundaries of congressional election districts, although not the number of representatives each state has, which is determined by the state's population. We'll talk more about election districts in a future episode. That's what gerrymandering has to do with. Remember when I gerrymandered the eagle? Yeah, that's a preview from what's coming. Although this is not always true in every case, as a general rule of thumb, the federal government is more likely to pass laws that expand voting, and states are the governments that restrict voting, especially through registration requirements and taking away the vote from people convicted of felonies. One important aspect of American elections that has been set up by state laws is the way that winners have been decided. We like to say that in America, majority rules, but for the most part, this isn't really true, at least as far as elections are concerned. In most states and in most elections, we follow the plurality rule, and this has important consequences for American politics. Let's go to the thought bubble. Under the plurality rule, the candidate with the most votes wins. The number does not have to be a majority, and the more candidates in the race, the less likely anyone will get the majority. Suppose your election has four candidates, A, B, C, and D. Candidate A gets 20% of the vote, candidate B gets 30%, candidate C gets 25%, and candidate B also gets 25%. That should add up to 100%. It does? Thank goodness. Okay, so no one has a majority here, so who wins? Candidate B, of course, because she has the most votes, 30%. Now you'll notice something about this election that may be a bit of a paradox. The significant majority of voters in this election, 70% in fact, have chosen not B. Yet B is the one who wins. This is why we need to be very careful when we say that majority rules, because in many cases it doesn't. But in some cases it does. Some states do have a majority rule in their elections. In these states, if no candidate gets more than 50% plus one of the vote, then the top two vote getters go on to what's called a runoff election. In this second election, you almost always get a majority. In many cases, we also say that American elections are winner-take-all 
all. This is the case in 48 out of 50 states when it comes to electoral votes. What this means is that the winner of the election gets 100% of the state's electoral votes, even though it's not very likely that they would have carried 100% of the voters. It is possible for a state to decide to award its electoral delegates proportionately, based on the percentage of votes that a candidate receives, or even by electoral district, although the latter rule causes some problems, as we'll see in another episode. Thanks, Thought Bubble. So the plurality rule can result in the majority of people being represented by someone they voted against. This seems like a bad system, so why do we have it? The main reason is efficiency. Under a plurality rule, you get a definite winner that you might not have under a majority rule. It also allows for a greater variety of candidates to win, at least potentially. And it has one key result for America's political system. It pretty much ensures that we will have only two viable political parties. The concept that plurality rules create two-party systems is explained by something called Divergy's Law. Here's how it works. Imagine political parties on a continuum from extreme right to extreme left. Most voters will not fall into either extreme, so the masses of party followers will coalesce around the center right and center left. In these conditions, there's no incentive to form a third party because it's likely to take votes away from the centrist party and thus throw the election to the other party. Let's say that you're on the right of the political spectrum. You like the ideas of the center right party, but you think they're a little bit weak and you'd like to see someone speak up more for your rightmost ideas. You could vote for the candidate whose ideology and policies are more to your liking, but they're not likely to win. Remember, most people prefer center right ideas over extreme right ideas. That's why they're extreme. So the candidate you would most like to support isn't going to win, but what's worse for you is that by voting for them, you take away votes from the candidate you partially agree with. Since people know that third parties almost never win, we're left with only two parties in the U.S. Now, Divergy's Law is important for political scientists, and it explains broadly why we have two parties. But a look at American politics in the second decade of the 20th century suggests that parties are more extreme than the model would lead us to believe. The polarization of parties is a subject of another episode on the composition of parties and how they reflect political ideologies. But for now, it's still useful to understand how elections themselves work to shape the party system we have in the U.S. This is what we sometimes call a structural or institutional view of politics, and it's the kind of thing that political scientists really, really like. We'll look closely at the actual political parties and at who votes for which one in other episodes, but I hope we've provided a little bit of insight into how elections work in the U.S. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Crash Course Government and Politics is produced in association with PBS Digital Studios. Support for Crash Course U.S. Government comes from Vocal. Vocal supports nonprofits that use technology and media to advance social equity. Learn all that information. That's right. So, what did you get from that, as far as the uh, elect election process? Equals should not vote. You're going to have to so talk really loud. Uh, that's okay, you didn't need to. <laughs> There's a lot more to elections than I thought. So a whole lot more to elections than just voting, right? still don't understand the whole concept of the Electoral College. That's a really good point, and that's something we're going to be talking about right now. So I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, I, I don't think anybody really understands the whole point of the Electoral College, except for the fact that um, it, is, it is another one of the uh, balance. Um, are you losing your table? You good? Just pick it up and throw it. <laughs> Maybe it'll be better, I don't know. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Electoral College. Some really pretty incredible things. Is that too bright for everybody? Which way do I do this? I don't remember. I think it's this one. Yeah, okay. Uh, some incredible things. Something that just is happening Think it's in California. Anybody know what's happening with the vote or the right to vote in California? Pretty sure it was California. They just said it on the news this week. There, there's a um, a proposal being made that 16-year-olds will be allowed to vote. That's cool. Limited in California. Okay. Uh, so that's going to be like a serious debate, okay? Uh, there was a big, strong debate when it went from 21 to 18. Yeah, 18 year olds are, they sh showed a soldier, okay? The reason they showed that soldier was because you're 18, you're able to go to war for our country, but you weren't able to vote. So how, how, 
you weren't, Unf able, you weren't able to vote for, for the person that could send you a war. Yeah, so how unfair was that? You know, so, so there, was, there was that. Um, and now I think what they're looking at is, you're old enough to drive at 16, right? You get your driver's license, so you can operate an automobile, take your life and everybody else's life around you as far as uh, jeopardy is concerned, driving down the road, but you're not allowed to vote. So Why change it? Why change it? Why, why, they, why they have those urge they need to change it? We need to vote. Well, there's a there's another really good question. Okay, why? My personal opinion is 16 year old voters can be influenced more than more than 18 year old. Which that's like bad that they would want to like. I don't know. That's just I don't like that. Trump get less votes. It's not. Never mind. Yeah, I, and your your thoughts, your thought pattern, or your your, your um, what influences you changes, especially around 15, 16, 17 years old. I think even into your twenties. But um, the other thing that influences you strongly, if you're 60 years old, would be the adult in your life and and what do they think and how do they um, act I know when I was growing up my my dad was strongly one one direction one candidate one ticket uh, when you start to vote there's a thing called a straight ticket or you can vote you can vote any candidate you want to in any, you, when you're voting, when you go to a voting booth, you can vote for a Republican for this. You can vote for a Democrat for that. You can vote for an Independent for this. You can vote anything you want to once you're in the booth. But um, you can also vote like row A if it's your, if that's your candidate, if that's your um, party line. You can vote right down the party line. You don't even have to know half the people that you're voting for. You're just voting for your party line. And either way, um, Republican or Democrat, you just vote for your party line. Well, the bad thing about that is you don't know who you're voting for. You could be voting for like the worst candidate possible to be a senator in your district because they happen to be from your party.